Assalamualaikum. <coughs> so, um, what we will do in this lecture is that we'll, we'll be talking about uh, uh, the first of recombinant DNA based molecular techniques. So, we'll be talking about uh, DNA cloning and we will be talking about recombinant DNA technology and what it means exactly. So, what DNA cloning is, is that it's a technique that allows for amplifying a DNA segment into many, many copies in a biological system. So, I have uh, a, a DNA fragment. It can be a gene. It can be any sequence in the, in the human genome. And we put it in a biological system like bacteria, for example, like yeast, uh, human cells maybe. Uh, that that we use in in the lab cultured human cells and so we put this uh, DNA inside these cells and these cells make many copies of this DNA uh, fragment or segment or um, so this DNA uh, fragment can be a gene a gene that produces a protein okay so we can insert this gene as well in again different types of cells and we can produce uh, many copies of this gene, that's one, or we can express a gene itself into uh, a protein inside this cell. So, um, it usually involves the formation of what we call as a recombinant DNA. So, a recombinant DNA is basically a DNA, a piece of DNA that is made of, uh, uh, of, of DNA from two different sources, two or more different sources. So like, like we put human DNA, uh, we integrated with bacterial DNA. This is recombinant DNA. So we put this DNA in a vector, which is a carrier of this DNA fragment of interest. An example is bacterial plasmid, and we'll talk about bacterial plasmid in a second. So we put it in a bacterial plasmid and we can use restriction endonucleases. We already talked before about restriction endonucleases. I'm going to define these endonucleases in a second. Okay. So we insert this recombinant DNA okay, into, um, into the uh, cells and these cells are the factories. They produce um, copies of this DNA fragment or they uh, express the gene into proteins. So, what are restriction endonucleases? Restriction endonuclease. So, an endonuclease is an enzyme that degrades DNA within a molecule, okay, that is inside a molecule. It's different than an exonuclease. An exonuclease is an enzyme that degrades DNA, that is, it removes nucleotides from either end. Of DNA from the five prime end or the three prime end. Now, an endonuclease cuts the DNA. It degrades the DNA. It cleaves the DNA by breaking the phosphodiester bond between nucleotides within the DNA fragment. Within the DNA fragment. Now, restriction endonucleases are bacterial enzymes. So, bacteria produce these enzymes to protect themselves from bacteriophages. So what is a bacteriophage? It's basically a virus that sits on the plasma membrane of bacterial cells. It inserts its DNA inside these cells and this DNA hijacks. It controls the bacterial cell. It, could, it controls the genetic system of bacterial cells. And what it does is that it amplifies inside the, the cell and it takes over. Uh, it, it makes bacteria produce many copies of bacteriophages. Okay? Um, eventually, bacterial cells uh, get disrupted uh, because they, they get full, they, they become full of, uh, of, of these bacteriophages. They are filled up with these bacteriophages. So they just explode, releasing many, many bacterial, bacteriophages, and these bacteriophages then can infect other bacterial cells. So in order to protect themselves from these bacteriophages, what bacteria do is that they produce these restriction endonucleases, 
and they cleave the bacteriophage DNA. Okay, now, uh, so these endonucleases uh, cleave uh, DNA by breaking phosphodiester bonds. They recognize specific sequences, so there, there are like hundreds of these restricted endonucleases. Uh, bacteria can produce uh, one or two. Uh, each bacterial type or species will produce one or two or, or so. Um, um, and, and these restricted endonucleases recognize certain sequences. And these sequences are known as restriction sites. Um, and cleavage occurs within these restriction sites, producing restriction fragments. So, so these here, the, the pieces of bacteriophage DNA, uh, are called restriction fragments. So these are known as restriction endonucleases because they restrict the growth of bacteriophages. And it just happens that the restriction sites that are recognized by restriction endonucleases are in general palindromic, meaning that they are read um, uh, the same from either fragment. So going five prime to three prime, uh, like uh, this restriction in the nucleus ECR1, which is produced by a bacteria known as E. coli. Um, the, you can read the restriction site, or it recognizes this, in the nucleus recognizes this sequence, G A A T T C. Okay, now uh, if you read uh, the other fragment, the, the complementary strand, 5 prime to 3 prime, it reads exactly the same, G A A T T C. Now, this is another. Um, another restriction in the nuclease produced by different bacteria and uh, you look at the sequence it's A A G C T T if you read the other the complementary strand 5 prime to 3 prime as well A A G C T T okay small one a third uh, in the nuclease same exact thing C C C G G G C C C G G G it's palindromic okay now, so these restriction endonucleases in general, they can uh, cleave DNA in two different ways. They either make blunt cuts, blunt breaks. Blunt means like sharp. So uh, if I say, uh, for example, uh, don't, don't be blunt. Okay, that is, don't be sharp, don't, don't be uh, too honest, don't be um, uh, too forward in what you say. He's so blunt, he's so honest, okay, so it's a really sharp cut. Uh, so you have cleavage, let's say, uh, between A and T, okay, so it's going like this, for example. But this is not the case in here, um, because this is known, this right here is known as a staggered cut or off center. Now, this is a restriction site for the endonuclease uh, echo R1. Now, echo R1 recognizes G, A, A, T, T, C, and the cut occurs between G and, and A on both strands. So you have a cut right here, and you, ha you have a cut right there on the other, on the complementary strand, producing what is known as a sticky ended DNA fragments. Okay, sticky ended DNA fragments. Um, that is, uh, you, you have the this end right here being free. It's not hydrogen bonded to the uh, to anything else. Okay, so this is free DNA right here on both strands. Okay, and it's known as sticky in the DNA, or you have these ends being sticky because they can reform hydrogen bonds with each other. These two strands, they are complementary, so they can hydrogen bond to each other. These are also known as cohesive ends because there is cohesion, again, hydrogen bonding between the two strands. Now remember that the cleavage here occurs by breaking the phosphodiester bond, which is a covalent bond. It's, it's really stable. Hydrogen bonds are not. Hydrogen bonds are reversible. 
So yes, these two DNA fragments can come back and they can form hydrogen bonds with each other, but they are not stable. They can uh, they they can dissociate from each other. They can be uh, released from each other. So these are known as overhangs as well. Okay, so sticky ends, uh, cohesive ends, uh, overhangs. Uh, that is, in other words, dendale. Uh, uh, All right. So. So, you can imagine that if you have two DNA fragments from different sources, uh, let's say two bacterial DNA fragments, if you have one human, one, one bacterial, one mouse, one human, and this, these DNA fragments have a GAATTC, and then you add a CAR1, you will have a cut um, between G and A uh, on each one of them. Okay, so each one would produce sticky in the DNA fragments. So if you combine them with each other, if you combine these uh, two DNA uh, fragments to each other, the ends are complementary to each other, right? Uh, regardless if they are mouse, human, or whatever. So you have GAATTC um, from uh, in the, or you have GAATTC. Uh, on one and you would have a cut between G and A on one of them and same thing with the other one. So you have two sticky in the DNA fragments, restriction fragments. Now these can meet and see each other and they are complementary. So you will have the formation of hydrogen bonds between the two strands. Now if you add a DNA ligase, you will have the formation of a phosphodiester bond uh, between the G and A here and G and A right there as well so you can you can recombine you can recombine these two dna fragments or i should say you can combine not recombine you can you would combine these dna fragments to each other so you will have uh, one fragment from let's say human and the other fragment um, being a mouse dna fragment now this is recombinant dna So again, if you add a DNA ligase, um, you, which needs ATP, um, you will have the formation of a phosphodiester bond or phosphodiester bonds between um, the, the uh, two strands. Okay, um, And you will have, again, a recombinant DNA. Now, so what is cloning? Cloning means that you make copies of something. So let's say you have bacteria, uh, starting with one bacterial cell, uh, this can grow into multiple cells. So you would have a clone right here, a clone of cells. That is, you have cells originating from one single cell. So this would be a clone, this would be another clone, and this would be a third clone. So this is clone. So if I say human cloning, mean it means that I'm making copies of the same human individual um, having the same exact genetic background. Okay, so all of these cells would have the same exact genetic background or DNA as the original one. So these are clones of this one right here. These are clones of this cell right there, and so on. Now, so how do we clone a DNA molecule? So basically what we do is that we need a vector. We need a carrier, okay? And this carrier, usually it is a plasmid, a bacterial plasmid, which is a circular, it's a small circular DNA naturally it contains genes that benefit bacterial cells like uh, it, it gives them nutritious advantage it gives them advantage against antibiotics and so on now um, now this plasma right here is cut by a restriction endonuclease producing sticky ended dna now it's circular and it becomes linear Okay, so you have these sticky ends right here. 
Now you take a DNA fragment of interest, let's say a fragment that represents a gene, whatever gene that is, and the same endonuclease is added, producing the same exact sticky ends. Now these are combined to each other, and since these sticky ends are complementary to each other, you would have the formation of one continuous circular DNA which is a recombinant DNA, or in this case, it's a recombinant plasmid. Of course, remember that these are combined with each other by hydrogen bonds, and they are not stable. They are reversible, uh, non-covalent interactions. So in order to stabilize this molecule, we add a ligase, and this ligase forms uh, phosphodiester bonds on each end of the DNA fragment and each end of the plasmid. So this whole thing is known as recombinant DNA technology. That is uh, a technology that allows for the formation of recombinant DNA and it's part of what we call genetic engineering. All right. <clears throat> what is a plasmid? It's a vector. Okay, it is a circular DNA, small DNA, and an advantage of plasmids is that they can transfer from one bacterial cell to another. Okay, that's an advantage. Another advantage of plasmids is that they contain genes that benefit bacterial cells, and that's how bacterial cells can. Um, uh, can can uh, grow as a community, okay, helping each other. Now, a third advantage is that they replicate independently of the uh, bacterial chromosome. So bacterial cells can have multiple copies of the same plasmid. Why? Do they replicate independently? Because they have their own origin of replication. We talked about origin of replication before. So basically it is a DNA sequence that allows for the initiation of DNA replication. So each plasmid would have its own origin of replication. Again, it's a place where replication of DNA starts. Now these plasmids, in order to, uh, to use them in recombinant DNA technology and in order to produce multiple copies of themselves, they need origin of replication. So a plasmid that we use for recombinant DNA technology has to have its own origin of replication. Now another, uh, another uh, feature of cloning vectors or cloning uh, plasmids is that they have to have um, an antibiotic resistance gene or they have to have a selective gene okay meaning that they have to have a gene that would allow us to select for bacterial cells that have these plasmids and bacterial cells that do not have plasmids we don't want them an example of a selective gene is antibiotic resistance gene, like uh, a, a gene that allows bacterial cells to be to become resistant uh, of uh, ampicillin, for example, any antibiotic. So bacterial cells that have such a plasmid would survive if we add ampicillin. Bacterial cells that do not have the plasmid, if we add ampicillin to them, they would die. So we select for bacterial cells that have these plasmids. Now, a third feature of these plasmids is that they have to have a place where we can add um, a, 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 a foreign DNA to them. Meaning they have to have a restriction site for a an endonuclease. So if we add this endonuclease, it has to make a single cut, okay, or uh, a cut at a cert at a, at, a at a single site, I should say. Um, 
Now, because if you add a restriction in the nucleus that makes two or three cuts or even more, it would become fragmented. We don't want that. We want only a single cut so that it opens up and it becomes um, uh, straight or a chain or a, or a flat DNA, not circular. So three features. One, they have to have an origin of replication so that they can replicate independently of a bacterial chromosome. Two, they must have a selective gene, a gene that allows us to select for bacterial cells that have these plasmids. And three, they have to have a site, a restriction site that uh, allow that would allow us to open up the plasma so that we can insert the DNA fragment of interest. So this is basically what we do. We take a cell, a human cell, a host cell. We take the DNA fragment from it, the, the, the fragment that we want to amplify, the fragment that we want to, um, uh, to clone. Okay we add a restriction endonuclease producing sticky ended DNA uh, fragment. Now we take the plasma from bacterial cells and these days by the way we purchase these plasmids from, from uh, different companies and uh, companies engineer these plasmids so they, they produce uh, uh, plasmids with different features. So we add the same exact endonuclease, producing uh, sticky ended plasmids. So they have the same exact sticky ends as the DNA fragment. We combine them with each other and we add a DNA ligase. So we have now the recombinant DNA produced, a recombinant plasmid. We uh, insert the plasma back into bacterial cells and these bacterial cells would make the many many copies of uh, of this plasmid and that's cloning so again we open up the plasma uh, by adding a restriction endonuclease we add the same restriction endonuclease to the DNA fragment to be cloned um, we combine them, we add a DNA ligase, so you have a recombinant plasmid, we add the recombinant plasmid into bacterial cells, and we add the antibiotic. Now, bacterial cells that have the plasmid would survive. Bacterial cells that do not have the plasmid would die because, again, they are not resistant to the antibiotic. So these bacterial cells would make multiple copies of this plasmid. So you can just imagine that if I have a bacterial cell and, and, and these bacterial cells, they divide every 20 minutes and we come back next day. So we start the experiment, we gr start growing these cells at four o'clock in the afternoon. If we come back at nine in the morning and, and, and we, we would have billions of these cells. Okay. And each one of them would contain multiple copies of the same plasmid. So we're producing a huge amount of plasmids um, as a result of that. So now we have these recombinant DNA. We can isolate the uh, plasmid. We get it out of these bacterial cells. And how can we release this uh, DNA fragment of interest? How can we release the, this DNA fragment from the plasmid? We just add the same restriction in the nuclease. It cuts it and it gets released and that's it. So that's how we do DNA cloning. All right, now, so as I said, the DNA fragment can be a, a gene that produces a certain protein. An example is insulin, for example, the insulin gene. Now, um, Remember that, uh, so le le genes, uh, in order to express these genes, you have to have a promoter, which is the binding site of RNA polymerases, or the RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase sits here, and it starts transcription, producing messenger RNA. Of course, you have to have a termination sequence as well. And all of this can be engineered, by the way. So producing a lot of messenger RNA, and then you have translation taking place in bacterial cells as well, producing a protein. Again, 
you have to have a translation uh, start site, which is AUG, the codon, AUG, which produces methionine. And you have to have a translation, um, a stop codon, uh, which is the uh, one of the three codons, UGA, UAA, UAG. Uh, so you, you have the production of a polypeptide that folds, uh, uh, forming three-dimensional structure known as a protein. Now, the vector that we talked about before is known as a cloning vector. That is a vector where uh, where that that can be amplified, producing uh, a lot of uh, DNA fragments inside bacterial cells. Now, in order to produce a protein in bacterial cells, we need uh, a different type of vector, and it's known as an expression vector. Now, in addition, these expression vectors must have additional features. So, in addition to a sequence representing origin of replication, a sequence that represents a selective gene like an antibiotics resistance gene and a place where we can insert the DNA fragment of interest inside this vector, we need other sequences. And these sequences include a promoter sequence. Where the promoter is, again, the RNA polymerase binding site that allows for transcription to take place. Another thing is a ribosomal binding sequence. In bacteria, it's known as the shine dolgarno sequence, a place where uh, the, a place where or a sequence that exists in the in the RNA, the messenger RNA, a place where the ribosome sits, allowing for translation to take place. Of course, it takes place at the AUG, the start codon, and of course, you have to have a stop codon as well at the end of this gene. Okay, so you have to have a, a transcription termination sequence as well at the end of the gene. Okay, so a transcription termination sequence, and of course, like I said, uh, a, a stop codon to terminate translation. Now, we insert the expression vector inside bacterial cells. So these bacterial cells, we, we bacterial cells, we take advantage of them. They produce many many copies of the protein of interest. And this protein can then be purified, and we will talk about the uh, uh, the protein can be purified, and we'll be talking about protein purification at the end of this course. So we can produce many different types of uh, uh, human proteins in some bacteria, in, such as insulin, growth hormones, and so on. And these can be given to patients. So here. Um, this is, by the way, gel electrophoresis for proteins, same concept as the DNA gel electrophoresis. So this is bacteria with no, um, with, with no vector. So of course, there's no expression of the protein of interest. And these are different types of proteins that are separated according to size. So these are large proteins, these are small proteins, and so on. And this is, uh, these are bacterial uh, proteins taken from bacterial cells that uh, contain uh, a plasma and expression vector for a certain uh, protein. And you can see this is the protein of interest. It produces a lot of proteins, as you can see from the intensity of the band. Now, when it comes to expressing uh, human proteins in bacteria, there are two challenges. One challenge is that there are many types of RNA molecules inside, back in, inside human cells. So you have the protein coding RNA molecule, which is messenger RNA. But you also have non-coding RNA molecules. And these non-coding RNA molecules include ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, and the different types of RNA molecules that are, again, non-coding. But they have uh, uh, important regulatory functions or purposes inside these cells. So you have the long non-coding RNA, you have the micro RNA, and, and so on. 
So how can we select for messenger RNA only? Now the solution is that we use two things. We use a reverse transcriptase. A reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that generates DNA from RNA. In other words, um, it reverse transcribes. So, it, so in in uh, in in contrast to going uh, in in doing transcription, that is taking DNA as a template and using it to produce RNA, we do the reverse. That is, we use RNA as a template and we produce DNA from it. This is known as complementary DNA or cDNA. A complementary DNA is a DNA that is made from RNA. Okay? Now, this reverse transcriptase is viral in nature okay only last year a reverse transcriptase has been discovered in human cells which is quite exciting now this reverse transcriptase regardless the the viral uh, reverse transcriptase requires a primer remember what a primer is it is a short dna sequence uh, actually, it's a uh, in in human cells in 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 replication. It is a short RNA sequence where the DNA polymerase uh, starts replicating or synthesizing uh, DNA, making another copy of DNA. So the DNA polymerase cannot start replication um, de novo. That is by itself. It starts replication at a certain sequence, which is uh, added by a primase, and then it, you know it, it starts um, uh, replicating DNA. So reverse trans transcriptase also requires a primer, and the primer that we add is a, a DNA primer. By the way, um, polymerases or reverse transcriptases do not care if it is uh, DNA or, or RNA. Um, its DNA is fine, so that's what we do outside of cells. So you have a a primer, and this primer is a poly T primer, so it binds to the messenger RNA. Now this, because messenger RNA contains a poly A tail, a human messenger RNA contains a poly A tail as part of RNA modification. So we add the poly T primer and the reverse transcriptase makes a copy of uh, DNA that is complementary to the messenger RNA. Okay, and it can also make a second, uh, the second strand, the complementary strand as well. Okay, so all of these RNA molecules do not contain poly A tail. It's only the messenger RNA that contains the poly ATL. So if we isolate all RNA molecules, all different types of RNA molecules from human cells, and we add the poly T primer and we add the reverse transcriptase, the reverse transcriptase would amplify only messenger RNA molecules, and that's how we select for messenger RNA molecules. So this is the solution for um, uh, for uh, the first challenge, that is, we have different types of RNA molecules. How can we select for messenger RNA only? Now, the second challenge is that, um, remember that genes contain introns, right? So we have exons and we have introns. Exons are the parts of genes that, uh, that become part of proteins and introns are removed. Right. So how can we uh, uh, clone genes without introns? Well, exactly the same solution as before. We use a reverse transcriptase. So we take the messenger RNA, we isolate it from all of uh, from all of the other RNA molecules, and we add a reverse transcriptase. And the reverse transcriptase would uh, produce the uh, double-stranded complementary DNA. So this complementary DNA, the cDNA, 
is basically a representative of the gene without entrance. Synthesis of human proteins in a bacteria is not really straightforward. It's not easy and it can be tricky. And the reason for that is that human proteins, first of all, they can have disulfide bonds. So here's an example. Here you have an antibody. So it, it has this Y shape structure. And we'll talk about antibodies later on. So these antibodies are composed of four polypeptide chains. Here's one, that's the second one, and here's a third one, and that's a fourth one. So you have two, what is known as, uh, uh, are known as light chains, and two heavy chains, okay? Now, these polypeptide chains uh, are connected to each other by disulfide bonds, covalent bonds known as disulfide bonds. Even within the same polypeptide that is within the, the uh, heavy chains, you have disulfide bonds as well. That's one. Two, antibodies can also be modified by adding sugars to them. And this is known as glycosylation. Now, in bacteria, there, there is no glycosylation. There is no modification of proteins by adding sugars to them. Okay, so that's another, uh, another thing. Now, a third, it, or another, another reason why it's hard to express uh, many human proteins in bacteria is that you can have misfolding. That is, the three-dimensional structure of a protein is not formed properly in bacteria. And that results in protein degradation, and this is quite common as well. That is, you have uh, uh, proteins, human proteins expressed in bacteria, and these proteins are not recognized as normal bacterial proteins, so bacteria degrade these proteins. So as a result of that, a solution is to really express proteins in a eukaryotic system. An example is yeast. Now, yeast are single cell organisms. They are eukaryotes, so they have nuclear membrane. Uh, they have many uh, proteins that look like human proteins or many genes that also exist uh, in, in uh, human cells as well. And they are eukaryotes. So they modify proteins, they have by glycosylation, they, uh, they can fold proteins uh, better than bacteria. Um, they can modify proteins by glycosylation and so on. So let's say that we express a protein in a bacterial cell or yeast or even human cells. Uh, the question is, how can we, one, identify this protein? Uh, number two, how can we purify this protein? How can we isolate this protein from all of the other proteins? Well, one mechanism, one way by which we can do that is by tagging proteins. Now, what we mean by uh, protein tagging is that we add a tag, we add a label to proteins, just like having a label on t-shirts and shirts and whatever. And these labels, they, they give us information about these t-shirts or whatever, okay? And, and they allow us, in terms of biochemistry and molecular biology, we can use these tags to identify proteins, to detect proteins inside these cells, and they may also allow us to uh, purify and isolate these proteins from the rest of the cellular components. So we create protein hybrids, just like we do in DNA. So, so how can we uh, tag a protein? How can we label a protein? Well, what we do is that we do the same exact thing. We use a vector. And this vector contains a tag as part of it. Okay, so it's a small piece of DNA that encodes a, an amino acid sequence. 
and when and and we in when we insert the DNA fragment of interest, the gene, we inserted right uh, where the the tag exists. Okay, so now the tag becomes part of the gene itself. Then we express the gene inside bacterial cells, and the tag is synthesized along with the protein, so it becomes part of a protein. So this is a tagged or a labeled uh, protein. Again, this is the recombinant uh, protein. And this allows us to identify the protein, to detect the protein, or even isolate the protein. So, how can we isolate the protein that is tagged? Well, we do what is known as affinity chromatography. So, it's basically you have something like a cylinder, okay, and we have these uh, beads, kharazat, okay, resin. And you have a ligand, a small molecule attached to these. Uh, beads or ligands and we we put we put the beads inside this cylinder and uh, We pass all proteins isolated from cells through this column Okay, this cylinder and the protein that has affinity that is uh, strength of interaction the protein that uh, uh, That that can bind to the ligand would bind to the ligand like in the blue protein right here, all of the other proteins would pass out. And then simply what we do is that we uh, isolate, we release the protein of interest from the column. Okay? This is known as affinity chromatography, and uh, we'll be talking about affinity chromatography later on in this course. So here we isolate a protein, we purify it from the rest of proteins and you can refer to uh, this uh, YouTube video uh, to learn more about affinity chromatography what we can also do is uh, to to separate protein a certain protein from the rest of other proteins inside cells by immunoprecipitation now whenever you hear the word immuno you, you should know that we're talking about antibodies and these antibodies are really specific okay so they bind to other proteins really specifically so what we do is that we have a we have a bunch of proteins we have large collection of different proteins what we do is that we add a resin and a bead again and this bead contains um, uh, antibodies attached to the surfaces of these beads. Um, now, when we add them, when we add these beads to the uh, protein combination, um, the antibodies will bind to the protein of interest very specifically. These beads are heavy, so they precipitate the trussable. Okay, we, they they go all the way down, and we can remove all of these proteins, and we would have only the beads with the protein of interest bound to the beads. Then we can simply release the protein of interest from the antibodies, and here we have a purified protein. Now this is known as immunoprecipitation. So this, this antibody, for example, would bind very specifically to one protein and not all of the other proteins. So really specific binding. So that's immuno precipitation. Now, the first two techniques allow us to uh, isolate a protein from a, or, or to purify it from a bunch of other proteins. Now, in this third technique, um, we can detect a protein. We can identify a protein using gel electrophoresis, just like in proteins, it's just like in DNA where we separate DNA fragments according to size, we can do the same thing with proteins. So we have a gel, a special gel. Um, we apply our sample uh, into wells. Proteins, uh, I, I, electricity is applied, a current is applied. Proteins migrate through the gel according to size. So they look like bands. 
right? So each band contains like many, many copies of the same protein uh, or different proteins of the same size. Okay, so we can see how pure our sample is. We, we can see if our uh, uh, protein exists um, uh, in a certain sample. And again, you can watch this uh, YouTube video or any other video, by the way. Okay, now we can take it a step further. We can do, we can do something like southern blotting. We can do what is known as immunoblotting just like southern blotting. We have our proteins separated through a gel according to size. We transfer these proteins to a membrane, this piece of paper, and we can then uh, add antibodies. And these antibodies have signals attached to them, just like probes having radioactive label or fluorescent label. So these antibodies would bind to the protein that they recognize very specifically and they give us a signal so the band lights up it gives a signal and we can detect this signal again just like southern blotting so if the antibody which is quite specific to the protein of interest uh, the band would light up and um, we know that the protein exists in this sample and again you can watch this YouTube video Now, there are different types of tags that we can use, and they have different purposes. Um, so, for example, I'm going to focus on the ones in red right here. So, we have what is known as a green fluorescent protein that we can attach to our protein of interest. We have an enzyme known as glutathione S transferase, or we can have a small tag that composed of six uh, amino acids uh, known as histidine so this is known as polyhis tag okay now and they have different purposes so green fluorescent protein would allow us to detect the protein using fluorescence or even antibody the glutathione protein would help us um, uh, purify a protein there's an antibody that recognizes this uh, enzyme right here so we can detect our protein of interest because uh, the protein would have the uh, transferase and the antibody would bind to the transferase which is attached to all protein of interest okay so we would know that the protein exists in our sample uh, the polyhist tag there's an antibody that is specific to these six histidine amino acids uh, so this would allow us to uh, purify our uh, protein of interest using affinity chromatography or detected using um, 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 an antibody. Of course, with the uh, transferase, we can also purify our protein uh, of interest using its substrate, the substrate for this uh, transferase. I'm going to show you uh, how in a second. So here's how we can um, purify and detect a protein uh, that is tagged with histidine. So we have our protein with the six histidine amino acids as part of, of the protein. And, uh, and, and this protein is highly expressed in bacterial cells. So this is gel electrophoresis. For all proteins, these two, the first two samples are uh, the, the, the total protein content in a cell containing our uh, protein of interest. And you can see that this is our protein. Okay. Uh, highly expressed and you can tell from the intensity of the band a lot of protein exists in these cells now after purification so, so this is uh, before purification after purification uh, we have our protein of interest right here so how is it purified well simply we have a column affinity chromatography column we have beads inside it and these beads contain nickel on the surface and this nickel binds to the six histidines and there's only one protein that contains six histidines one after the other uh, so so this protein would bind to the nickel on the beads so everything else uh, passes through the column except with the in, in, so inside the column we would have beads with nickel on, on the surface and the protein with the 
histidines attached to these uh, beads, and then we can release this protein later on. So again, this is a sample before these two samples are before purification. This is after releasing the protein from the column. So simply, we can clone our gene um, into a, a plasmid. We recombine it into a plasmid. We insert the plasmid inside bacterial cells. Bacterial cells express the protein of interest. We purify the protein using something like affinity chromatography, and then we can analyze it using gel electrophoresis. Well, we can also use um, glutathione as transferase uh, for the same purpose, to isolate, to purify our protein. So it's, it's uh, basically the same concept. Here we have a bead right here. Okay, so we have a bead. On the surface, we have glutathione, which is the substrate for this, this enzyme. And we have our enzyme attached to our protein of interest. That's our recombinant protein using the same exact thing. Uh, we pass all proteins through the column. Now, only our protein would bind to the glutathione. Everything else would pass through the column. And then we can simply release our uh, protein and we have it purified. Well, how can we produce a recombinant protein? Well, it's really quite simple because protein A, for example, is produced from its own gene and protein B is also produced from its own gene. What we do is genetic engineering. We have these two genes expressed all together, all at the same time. So you have transcription of the messenger RNA transcription of the gene into messenger RNA and this messenger RNA is translated as a whole uh, AUG is right here um, the stop codon is right there so this whole polypeptide is produced um, um, all at once and you have the formation of a recombinant protein well not only that but we can also use genetic engineering to produce uh, a protein that is made of different parts of proteins. And this is due to the power of domains, the concept of domains. So what is a domain? So a domain is basically, it's part of a protein. And this part, this region, uh, folds by itself. It has its own three-dimensional structure. It is self-stabilizing. It doesn't need uh, the rest of the protein to, um, uh, uh, to, to be stable. And it folds independently, okay? So for example, here we have a protein and it's, it is composed of uh, multiple domains. Here we have a domain and here we have another domain. And in green, we have a third domain. Now, if we cut this domain out of a protein, it maintains its structure and it maintains its function as well. Okay, same thing with the other domains. So we can, we can combine different uh, uh, domains from different proteins uh, using genetic engineering. So let's say here we have gene A and gene A produces um, a protein with two domains and we have gene B which produces a protein known as protein B, and it has also two different domains. Now, we can make a recombinant gene that produces domain of uh, for, uh, one domain from protein A and a different domain but from protein B, producing a recombinant protein that is made, from, uh, uh, that is made of different domains from different proteins. Now, this domain maintains its function and structure as well, and this domain maintains its, its structure and function as well. And this is how we can do this in cells, in bacterial cells, or yeast cells, or even human cells. 
and we have done it in uh, or we have done it using green fluorescent protein so what is green fluorescent protein so it's a protein uh, it has its own structure right here as you can see in here and it is produced from jellyfish now you've seen probably uh, jellyfish um, uh, you can watch this uh, video on your own um, so jellyfish can produce these proteins that that give fluorescence okay by themselves okay natural fluorescence what we do is that we have this green fluorescent protein and we attach it to our protein of interest so to our gene of interest so we have this our gene of interest and we add uh, a green fluorescent protein gene right before our protein of interest so our gene of interest so we the, so this produces our protein of interest right here attached or linked to the green fluorescent protein now our protein would then fluoresce not all not because it fluoresces no because it is attached to a protein that fluoresces so whenever this protein is expressed we know it exists because it fluoresces and we know where it goes inside cells as well as it moves so um, here watch this video this is jellyfish producing proteins uh, different proteins that fluoresce beautiful isn't it and scientists have done this uh, for different proteins um, this is a G green fluorescent protein uh, expressed in in all cells and the whole cell fluoresces this is if we attach the green fluorescent protein to the actin protein so you can see the actin microfilaments fluoresce uh, same thing with the tubulin same thing with expressing a uh, recombinant mitochondrial protein having green fluorescent protein as part of it so you can see the mitochondria fluorescing this is whole organisms whole rabbit or fish or mice uh, fluoresce because they express the green fluorescent protein these are in neuron neurons expressing green fluorescent protein so you can see how these neurons are connected to each other quite fascinating that's genetic engineering